Hey everybody, it is Tim Danter here from the Hair Curler Chronicles and welcome back to the channel. This is a two-part series again and in this first part uh, we are in conversation with Rob Brown who is Canadian and is the author of Wealthing Like Rabbits, a great self-published book on getting your personal finances in order. The objective of this video in part one is to sort of identify what we need to do and how it's going to sting at the beginning in order to get yourself back on track. The question is, folks, are you prepared to look head on into that deep, dark hole of what you're trying to avoid about talking about finances? It's not that hard, really. Nancy and I have done it. And throughout this interview, we will show you and share with you our journey as well. Hope you enjoy it and I'll be back at the end. Hello, hello, hello. Happy Sunday afternoon. Hi Nancy, how are you? Good, how are you? For, for our little uh, listening audience, whoever they may be, I can see my girlfriend Debbie is here. Um, Rob Brown, um, was a person who changed my life on many, <laughs> for many reasons. But about uh, just shy of eight years ago, you and I met, believe it or not. Can you believe it was, it was actually, it was a little over eight years ago. Um, you interviewed me for a job. And so yeah, I, I, I must have done something <laughs> to, to, to make you go, yeah, we'll, we'll take a chance on that one. Well, you, you know, I was I was thinking about that earlier, and I did see the irony that uh, eight years changed later, you were going to be interviewing me on a podcast, and I, and I felt bad because eight years ago, you brought me cookies, and I got no cookies for you today. Oh, here we are all these years later, and, uh, and uh, you know, it was so great. And, and, you know, it was interesting, Rob, because um, you at the time were the training manager who I was working for. And uh, I think you had just, you and I had started talking about the fact that I was writing a book. And, and you went on to actually finish it, publish yours. You said, oh, I'm writing a book too. And I went, really? That's a bizarre thing that the two of us are writing a book. And you actually went on to publish it and finish it. And now you are, I, like this book is amazing. And Thank tell you. us a little bit about Okay, well, I'll, I'll back up a little bit from there because you're right. It was kind of funny that at that time, both of us were uh, pretending to be authors and, and writing a book. And, and my book had already been in the works at that point for, I'm going to say, at least a year. I can't remember exactly where I was, but uh, I was just that guy that you uh, meet at parties or, or meet at work and that said, you know what, someday, someday I'm going to write a book. I just wanted to do it. And as I... Uh, as I approached my 50s and my, my wife kind of said, you know, listen, stop talking and start doing, you know, she didn't, she didn't quite say it like that, but pretty much. So that's when I really got serious and started to put pen to paper and started to write Wealthing Like Rabbits. And it did take me over two years to write the book and then another six months to edit it and design it and all that stuff. But the book was actually released in September. 2014. But understand that that sounds cool. My book was released. All that really means is that I'd had 500 copies printed. I had a buyer website up on Amazon and my own website. And that was it. And every once in a while, I'd, I'd get an email. And I'd, I'd sell a book because I did a little bit of promotion through bloggers and that sort of thing. But as Christmas approached that year, I uh, really got aggressive, put those sales skills to work and uh, started to do a lot of uh, weekend uh, book signings at Chapters Indigo. They'll let you come in as an unsigned author and schlonk your books at the front door. And, and I, I did pretty well at that. And just as we were getting ready for Christmas, I called Chapters Corporate and said, Hey, I'm Robin. I've been hanging out at your stores for the last two months on weekends. What do you think about listing my book? And they'd already heard of it. And they agreed to list it coast to coast in every one of their stores. So that was a really big win for me because I was just going into the Christmas season. And then after Christmas is January, February. And those three months are really the only time of the year that Canadians go out and buy money books, personal finance books for Christmas or in January when everybody makes a resolution to get their money under control. But it really did 
help launch the book and kick it off from a retail perspective. And then I left just shortly after that, at the end of January 2015, and found myself with a lot of time on my hands. So I got serious about promoting the book in retail at that point. And I did more author events. And I was on every personal finance podcast and blog that you can think of in Canada. And there's a real sub-community of personal finance authors and, and consultants and commentators. So I was on all of their podcasts. And, and they were... They were kind. They reviewed the book and they were very nice to the book. And then it got picked up on Amazon Prime. And somewhere mid-summer 2015 is is when it started to, to tip. I don't know if you read the, the Tipping Point by Malcolm Gladwell, but that's when its sales started to grow on its own without me doing anything in retail. And uh, by Christmas in 15, it was really selling well. So I was very proud of that. And... Um, yeah, that's kind of how the whole book sales thing got started the first year. It's an interesting thing that you were writing this at the time that I was in the sales pool because, um, you know, I, I, you, I think you know quite a bit about my story. I, and yep. Maybe I shared and maybe I didn't, but that you was did. a really scary, scary time for us. So I remember you writing the very first chapter about Lisa and her choice. And I remember after you gave it to me to read, I remember actually getting choked up thinking, oh my God, we're in the first scenario. We didn't, we didn't do it. <laughs> but it was not from any fault of our own. Like we did all the things we were supposed to do when we were younger, but then in 2008, we had a really big struggle with when the, fin the big financial crash happened. It hit us hard and we had to rely on the money that we had saved so it was hard reading the chapter that you had had written about Lisa. And um, but the second part of Lisa's story where she made different choices early on, Tim and I drastically, drastically cha made different choices that people I'm sure our friends thought these two are ding -lings. Like, what are they doing? Selling our house in Oakville. You know, uh, we we have cleared out debt we don't owe anybody except for on some mortgages on some properties we own but they are paying for themselves with renters so and we don't but we don't have any commercial like we don't owe credit cards we don't owe any of that and all that money that you when you read about in your book about home ownership is super expensive you're right like every single time i remember us talking about all this and this is before we made this radical decision but I, I arguably would say that it was reading the chapter about Lisa that that did it for me. I said, Tim, we got to do something different. Otherwise, we will retire with a nice house, but no savings because that's oh. the, the house was sucking the life out of us. Yeah. And, and it's interesting because I, I, I don't know. I don't remember if I told you this at the time, probably. But that first chapter on Lisa was actually the last chapter I wrote. I didn't know how I wanted to introduce the subjects that I was going to cover in the book in the opening chapter. When I when I started to write, I had a pretty clear idea of what I wanted to say, but I really struggled with how to open it. And when I came up with the idea of the, of the two leases, I didn't want to do it. And the reason I didn't want to do it is because when you first start to read it, it sounds like I'm going to be telling a uh, a novel, a story, just like Dave Chilton did in The Wealthy Barber. And I didn't want people to read it and say, oh, this is just another guy trying to rip off The Wealthy Barber. But at the end of the day, I couldn't think of another way to do it or I couldn't think of a better way. So I went ahead and did it. And interestingly, that first chapter, like you're saying, has been one of the best received chapters. A lot of people comment on it. And I've had other women in their 40s and 50s reach out to me after they've read the book and say they actually started to cry reading it. And of course, I don't feel good about the fact somebody was crying, but it did tell me that, you know, the, the way that I presented the messages was impactful. So in that sense, I was very proud of it. But it's also interesting that you mention, um, you know, you when you made changes, you know, some of your friends thought you were dinglings, and that's a phrase I don't get to use every day. So thank you, Nancy. Um, but 
when, when, I, when I finished promoting the book in retail, when I was selling in chapters and Amazon and Kobo and Kindle and all, the, and all that resale stuff was flowing smoothly, I started to do a lot of speaking, public speaking around the message of the book. And most of it at colleges and universities. And one of the three main points of my college university presentation isn't really about money at all. I tell the kids to make decisions that are right for them without worrying about what anybody else thinks. And it's called screw the Joneses, as in keeping up with the Joneses. But I really walk them through some of the pain they can incur long term by making decisions based on, you know, their social media feeds or how other people perceive them and really try to drill home that those decisions aren't always best for your long term. And you should be making decisions that are right for you and your future without worrying about what anybody else thinks. And that's a hard lesson to get across to a 20 year old. So as I was saying, one of my key messages to kids at colleges and universities is, you know, really make decisions that are right for you and your future and don't get too hung up on the whole keeping up with the Joneses thing. And we all do it to some degree. The trick is to recognize it and keep it under control. No, you know what? It's so true. And and one of the things that, uh, that I remember talking to you about, we were talking about um, our small little house in Oakville. We had been in a big house and then we had to move to a small house. And you and I were talking, Rob, and I said, I entertained a lot in my little house in Oakville. And nobody didn't come to my house because I didn't have granite countertops. And nobody didn't come to my house because um, it was this big, lovely place. It was, I had more parties, more gatherings. We would squish around in this little <laughs> kitchen. That, you know, you couldn't squeeze 10 people in there, but we would get 25. And nobody cared that I, you know, and, and I think... See, there were, those were the conversations that I was having with you. I was so scared that we were making the wrong decision. Um, and, and it turned out to be the very best thing we could have ever done. Like financially, uh, we are in a completely different place. But it was those conversations we were having with you about who does care? Who does care that my address is down in Oakville? Nobody, because nobody's paying my bills and they don't care about me. And honestly, Nancy, if they did care, are those the people you want to have friendships with? No. It's funny, Belinda and I were talking the other day, and we've been in the house that we're in now for, you know, just under 20 years. And we were lucky because when we bought the house, and it's, you know, it's a residential house, it's 1,600 square feet, it's not small. When we bought it, one of the reasons we bought it was because it didn't need any immediate work. There was things about it that weren't perfect, but there was nothing that was just has to be done right now. And I remember joking with Belinda that, that the kitchen sink was a, a ceramic kitchen sink and it was all cracked. It still works. I said, oh my God, you know, when we do get around to doing things, the first thing that's going to go is this kitchen sink. Still have it today. Still works. Don't care. It's true. It's true. And you know what's what's most interesting is the other things that I learned from your book too. Like, <clears throat> well, we certainly weren't maxing out our RSP or our TFSA. We weren't doing that at all because we were just really living quite to the nub. But now that we we do that now and we've caught up and we're, we're well, good for you. Good. Oh yeah. But it's even interesting that I don't even think I could have talked about my finances i i know i couldn't talk about my finances. i talk about debbie and i my friend that's on watching this now she and i said we were in such bad shape neither of us could talk about it, it used to make my stomach sick and uh and so now it's so different which is why we're on this new journey because we've got the retirement plan taken care of we've got ourselves in a position where peace of mind peace of mind is so much more precious to me than having a granite countertop. I don't care about those things. We own our cars. We don't owe a single thing on those things to anybody. I don't even think I've thought about buying a new car. It's funny how I see people going, oh, I gotta get my new car, I gotta redo my lease. We don't have a car payment. We don't have any of that stuff. And peace of mind is so much better. It It's so much better than anything else that money could possibly buy. Isn't it funny how something as as, as finite and defined as the math and your finances 
can have such a strong influence on those things that can't be defined, like your personal health, your mental health, your the, the quality of life you live, all those things. Yeah, no, you wanted to say something? I never let him talk, so we'll let him talk. <laughs> <clears throat> I think one of the things that we realized was that, uh, and what's important is, I um, mean, you sort of alluded to it with the kitchen sink, and, and I, I kind of thought of it in a different way, was it, I have a saying, is this a want or is this a need? Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, do you want this or do you need this, you know? And um, that, was, that was a very powerful term that I would throw around in the family when I did the budget for the financial diet. Oh, yeah, he yep. put me on a financial diet, Rob. It was, Excellent. It was so awful and so hard. But, but I will say of all of all the things that we did because it was he did it right after we moved um to this little cottage that we're in right now because we had as i said zero debt and he goes nance if we're going to catch up that means every spare cent has to go into investments has to so so and, and you know i told people tell people this financial diet thing and they think that he did it to me i was a very willing participant i would be i was begrudging about the whole <laughs> but I was a willing participant. Did you find it eye-opening? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Did, did, you, did you find certain categories where you were spending more money than you were aware, and maybe even more than aware, where you were really surprised to find out how much money was going out I in those there, categories? I think there was a lot of, um, we were desensitized, if you will, to the fact sure. that this was the automated lifestyle yeah and when you stop and you i mean it's it's like weight loss you have to watch what you're putting into your mouth you have to choose different foods um you know and this was the debt loss if you yeah. will so we <clears throat> we it was it was an eye opener to go do we really spend that much and you know it, it made us let, let me give you an example we were like what we would go out and we would eat uh go out go out and have a, a meal and at some point in time, when you start thinking about what it costs you, it's like, you know what? I can eat, I think, better and, and on my terms at home than going out and spending the money. Yeah. You know, um, it, it kind of put a twist on it in that respect. So, I mean, it was easier to stop going out, which is where we, we had. Yeah, we and, like to eat and it's interesting the way that different people frame that conversation in order to impact themselves. And I'm not judging on how anybody does that, but some people would say, and, and this is me, if I'm looking at buying a, a thing, a new, uh, a new set of headphones, and I didn't buy a new set of headphones because when they broke, I duct taped them together. But when, I, when, I, when, I, when I'm looking at a real purchase, I say to myself, well, okay, this is going to cost $200. Am I getting good opportunity cost for this $200? Is there something else that I would be better off spending this $200 on? And, and the restaurant example is a good example because you're right. You could spend that $200 on groceries and get four meals out of it instead of that nice dinner out. So that's good value. And another way that people frame it is, okay, if I'm going to spend $200 on this microphone, how long do I need to work in order to earn that two hundred dollars? And if, you know, if somebody's at a you know a, a minimum wage job, if there's a twenty something out there that's making sixteen bucks an hour, that's a lot of work to earn that two hundred dollars. So is that worth it? Am I willing to put that time in in order to have this thing? And the other thing I would add on the restaurant example is if you do eat out less, then when you do decide to go out for a special occasion it becomes a special occasion as opposed to going out three and four times a week when you're not going out to, to dine, you're just going out because you have to eat food at some point. So we, we try to keep all that in perspective as well. It's interesting that you mentioned, you know, uh, how long does it take you to earn that, that X amount of, of dollars? And we were, when we were journeying through this, we, we still had kids sort of in university and in uh, high school into college and stuff. And, you know, they'd say, well, it was only, it, and to your point, it's only $20. And said, yeah, but you got to make 40 to pay for it. That's right. You know, and they, right. they don't, don't get that. They didn't quite grasp that. Now, 
you know, our kids had a bit of a different upbringing because we, I've been an entrepreneur for my entire 33 years, gone through two uh, MTO strikes, gone through two recessions, bought my business uh, in a recession in 1990 where the interest rate on the loan was 18%. Um, and um, so they, they've seen the scary parts of life and what mom and dad go through and, and what a challenge money can bring to a relationship and to your health. Yeah. And now this next phase, um, with which is with this Hair Curler Chronicles, I didn't even hardly explain what we're trying to do with this, is, again, that whole peace of mind thing that we don't, um, we couldn't have done this journey that we're doing right now with, um, if we were still needing to figure out our finances. Thanks, Rob. That was really great. Um, you know, it we needed to be a little bit transparent uh, with where we have come from and, and what we've had to do in order to uh, sort of meet our financial needs. Um, and, you know, it's nothing against where we've come from. We don't have any regrets. It's just that at some point in time, I think to a degree, we all at a certain level try to keep up with the Joneses. And I think the, the real key and the strength is to identify that A, you're able to do that or B, you're doing it, but it's not going to get you to where you want in your retirement. So there was a lot of great information here uh, from Rob Brown. Uh, again, he's Canadian, self-published, wealthing like rabbits. Links are below for uh, where you can uh, get this, uh, this great book. Um, Nancy and I liked um, the first chapter about Lisa. And uh, you got to tune into part two uh, to hear more from Rob and uh, what our second favorite chapter of the, uh, the book was uh, all about. So again, if you're getting any value from this video, please hit the subscribe and like button, smash the notification bell so you're going to uh, know when to uh, uh, tune in for our releases. And uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. Please remember, ladies and gentlemen, that, that we are not financial uh, investors nor planners and that all this information is strictly just in conversation. Thanks for tuning in. Take care.